Hi, welcome. This is Research Methodology uh, for AP Psychology. This chapter is extremely important. It is the most important one. That's why I'm teaching it early in the year. With AP Psychology, everything that you learn in this chapter will be incorporated into other chapters. And you will see what I mean by that. Okay? So, Make sure you're taking notes. This is a little different than the other chapters. Okay, so what's the point? Why do we need science? Well, it's better than not having science. All right, without, without science, we'd still be drilling holes in people's heads to get the demons out. And we'd also have all these biases. You know, we think we know the answer, but we don't unless we do the science. Otherwise, we're doing guesswork. So without science, and these are all, a lot of these terms you need to know, not all of them, but we'd suffer from overconfidence. We think we, we, think we know more than we do. Hindsight bias, that's when we are like, I just knew that was true. No, you didn't. You have to do the experiment. Um, availability heuristic, like what comes to mind easily. We would suffer from that. Like we just, our mind automatically jumps to some thought. Representativeness heuristic, that's stereotyping. And we would confuse correlation with causation. Just because two things go together doesn't mean that one thing causes the other. This is a lot of information, but anyway, moving right along. You don't need to write this down yet. All right, so what is an experiment? Write all this down. Okay, so the experiment is, is what this video is going to be focusing on. It is the most important and most powerful method of study. It is the only type of study that establishes cause and effect. If you want to know if one thing causes the other, you have to do an experiment, okay? Otherwise, you're, you're doing some other kind of study. And, you know, you can't always do an experiment because of ethical violations. But let's just take this example that I'm gonna use a lot in this video. Does eating too many bananas cause constipation? Okay, so you would need to do an experiment. All right, we'll come back to this in a minute. All right, moving right along. All right, so write this down, this is important. When you do an experiment, what you're going to do is you are going to split a bunch of people up into two groups. And you're going to do something to one of the groups and then you're not gonna do that thing to the other group. That's something that you are going to do to the one of the groups. That's called the independent variable. Okay, so for example, oh, and write this down too. Does the independent variable cause the dependent variable? We'll talk about that in a second, and I will come back to this. So if you are trying to determine do bananas cause constipation? So you get a bunch, you get a hundred people, and you split them up into two groups, and you feed half of them bananas, and you feed the other half something other than bananas, and then try to determine how much constipation they have. Then bananas are the independent variable. Okay, so does the independent variable cause the dependent variable? So, does eating too many bananas cause constipation? The bananas are the independent variable. Okay, if you don't get this yet, you will, you have to eventually, but I'm going to keep giving you examples. Okay, write this down. 
the dependent variable is what are you measuring? So I'll give you an example. So earlier, do bananas cause constipation? What are you measuring? Constipation. That, so in that case, constipation would be the dependent variable. Um, anxiety is an example I use. Um, I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, let's say you are doing an ex you're doing a medicinal trial and you have a new anti-anxiety medication. And you give this pill, you set up an experiment, you give half the people the anti-anxiety medication, and you don't know if it works yet, and then you give the other half a sugar pill, and then you measure how much anxiety they have, anxiety would be the dependent variable. What are you measuring in an experiment? So the independent variable would be the pill, the anti-anxiety medication. The dependent variable would be what are you measuring? Anxiety. Don't worry, I'm gonna repeat myself a lot. All right, so, write this down. So if you are doing an, an experiment, let's say I've got 100 people and I give half the people bananas and I give the other half an apple or a glass of water or something or nothing. The experimental group is the group that gets the independent variable. They're the ones that eat the banana or get the anti-anxiety medication, which you don't know if it works yet, but they're the ones that get the independent variable in the experimental group. The other group, the control group, does not get the bananas, does not get the medication. They might get a sugar pill or a glass of water or something other than bananas. Okay, moving right along. Write this down. So, if you have a group of 100 people and you want to do an experiment. If you're going to do this correctly, you can't just say, all right, you guys on the left, you're getting the independent variable, and you guys on the right, you get nothing, or you get a placebo. You can't do that. You have to randomly assign them to either be in the experimental group or in the control group. Basically, you have to do the equivalent of putting all 100 people's names in a hat and drawing their names and randomly assign them to either the experimental group to get, to get the bananas, to get the pills, or to get the placebo, to get nothing, or to get just a glass of water or something. You have to do this. Why? Because... If you don't, then there could be some problems. The problems include, sorry. I've got a video I'm gonna show you in a minute that'll better explain it. But if you don't, if you just say, everybody on the left, you get the placebo, everyone on the right, you get the bananas or the pill, the independent variable, that doesn't work. You have to randomly assign them, otherwise, it's going to screw up your experiment, okay? All right, moving right along. Also, and I'll explain this, write down the red. If you wanna write down more, that's fine. Third variable problems is, is stuff that messes up your experiment that are not part of the experiment. Factors that affect the dependent variable, what you are measuring, that are not the independent variable. Uh, let's go back to the bananas causing constipation. So if you want to find out if bananas cause constipation, then a third variable problem would be something else that that person ate. 
That could be an example. A third variable problem could be how much water that person drank. If one person drank a lot of water and the other person didn't, then that could be a third variable problem. Something that affected constipation that wasn't the bananas. Something outside the experiment that screwed it up. Here's another example. So um, let's say you get 100 people and you want to measure their anxiety. Okay. What if you're doing an, ex an experiment on anxiety and something happened in the building right before you do the experiment, like a fire drill or a real fire? or a fight in the lunchroom or something. That would affect everybody's anxiety. Something other than the pill can affect the anxiety. That would be a third variable problem, okay? So dependent variable would be the anxiety, and if something affected anxiety other than the pill, then it messes up the experiment. We will, don't worry, I will repeat myself and we will get, we'll, we will keep talking about this. At first, this may be a little bit hard. Okay, confounding variables, write this down. Sorry if you have a snake phobia, but I, I wanted to show you something like a pretzel, how they're all wrapped up in each other. If you cannot unwind these variables in an experiment. So confounding variables is when you have two things that are hard to distinguish. I'll give you an example. So on Saturday, I felt sick. So in order to make myself feel better, I took a nap, I took some medicine, I drank two cups of coffee, and I went outside and got some sunlight. And now I feel better. So, and I ate some spicy food. So I did all this stuff at the same time, and now I feel better. So which one made me feel better? Well, I don't know, because they're all wrapped up in each other. They're all confounding. If I had just done one of the things and then I felt better, then maybe I could conclude that that one thing made me feel better. But since I did a whole bunch of things, then I'm not sure which one made me feel better. So when you do an experiment, you have to limit your variables. We call that controlling the variables. If you don't, then you're gonna have a problem with your experiment, okay? So that's called confounding variables. All right, so here's an example of confounding variables. Marijuana users are healthier than non-users. This was actually on the cover of Time Magazine about 10 years ago, and it's true. But what's, what's the problem? Does marijuana cause you to be healthy? Well, we don't know. In order to do that, we have to have an experiment. But there's a problem, though. Since younger people tend to smoke more than older people, and younger people tend to be healthier, then it looks like people who do smoke are healthier than people who don't. But it's not the marijuana that's causing it. That's correlation versus causation problems. Young people tend to be healthier. So yeah, overall, it looks like marijuana causes you to be healthy, but you'd have to do an experiment in order to find out. But as it stands right now, it's just correlation, not causation. There are too many confounding variables. Okay, marijuana and health are all age, marijuana and health are all confounded. All right, so I already said this, but the experimental group is the group that gets the independent variable. They are the group, write this down if you need to. These, this is the group that gets the bananas. This is the group that gets the anti-anxiety medication, okay? 
moving right along, pause if you need to. Control group. This is the group that is not exposed to the independent variable. This is the group that doesn't get the bananas. They don't get the anti-anxiety medication. Instead, they get a sugar pill or an inert substance. Inert means it's harmless. It doesn't do anything to you. Okay? You have to have a control group because you need it for a basis of comparison. You, so if you give everybody an anti-anxiety medication and then everybody gets more relaxed, well, what are you comparing it to? You gotta have a comparison. All right, moving right along. All right, so what is a placebo? A placebo is what you give to the control group. It, it is an inert substance. Mean, inert means it doesn't do anything to you, like a sugar pill or um, maybe a glass of water. You know, if you, if you, um, you know, that the control group may get a placebo, maybe a glass of water or a pill that doesn't do anything to you. That is called a placebo. Okay. All right, moving right along. Some, all right, this is important. So sometimes if you give a placebo to a group of people and you tell them that this stuff is going to have an effect on them and then it actually does have an effect on them, that is called the placebo effect. It's kind of like giving non-alcoholic beer to an 11 year old and you say this beer is gonna make you drunk but it's not because it's non-alcoholic beer. And then the 11 year old's like losing their balance and stuff. That's called the placebo effect. If I give you a pill and say this pill will um, take away your headache, and then you report that your headache is gone by 20%, and then you later find out that the pill was just a sugar pill, it didn't do anything to you, then that's the placebo effect. This happens all the time. Uh, it happens with antidepressant medications. You say this pill will reduce your depression, and then people who receive the placebo actually do report a reduction in depression. Because we human beings, we let our expectations affect us. We expect it to work, and then it actually does. It happens all the time. Here's an example of the placebo effect. Have you ever heard of CBD oil or CBD gummies? People are spending a lot of money on CBD this, CBD that. And I've always suspected that it doesn't really do anything. And, and, and I ran into this article, I actually sought it out. A new study shows that while CBD can help people deal with pain, this is due at least in part to a placebo effect. So basically, it doesn't work as much, considering how much expensive this stuff is, considering how much this stuff costs, it doesn't really do anything. But you take it and you expect it to get rid of your pain, then it does get rid of some of your pain. There is some placebo effect, okay? So just something to think about. All right, everybody. Let's try this question. A client whose improvement during therapy is the result of his or her expectation of improvement rather than the result of the therapy itself is showing what? The answer is B, placebo effect. Okay, moving right along. All right, this is important. Write this down. So when you are doing an experiment or any other kind of study, you have to very carefully and precisely define what are you studying. 
So I started off with the idea of do bananas cause constipation? Well, okay, how do you define constipation? I mean, let's be honest. I mean, it's not the easiest thing to define. I guess you could define it as a self-reported um, a self-report where the where the people say on a scale of one to ten, I have a five in terms of constipation. So self-report. Um, how do you define anxiety? Same thing. On a scale of one to ten, how anxious do you feel? That could be one way to define operationalization. But you got to do it. Preferably, you have to operationalize it in something that you could put on a chart, something numerical, something precise. If you are going to do a study on do ugly people make less money than attractive people, then you're going to have to operationalize ugly, or you're going to have to operationalize attractiveness. And that's not easy to do. It can be done, but it's not easy to do, but you've got to do it. Do you just ask um, people to rate a picture, or do you um, do you, do you have, take a picture of them and then measure their facial symmetry on, with a computer program? Both of those are okay ways to operationalize attractiveness, but you got to do something. Okay, so. Let's go over the steps in designing an experiment. And all this is very important. I'm going to show you a video. So you start with a hypothesis. Now, in science class, a hypothesis is an educated guess. But in psychology, it's a prediction. You say, I predict that eating bananas will cause constipation. Okay. Then you have to pick a population. You have to, and this is important, you have to randomly select people from the population that you want to study. You can't just, um, you can't just get um, a bunch of people, you can't just use your friends. You have to randomly select people from the population and then randomly assign them to either the experimental group or the control group. So those are two different things. You got to randomly select them from the population. For example, what if you only studied rich white men to be in your experiment? Uh, rich white American men. Well, then you have a problem. You, you need to have a random selection of all kinds of people. If you don't, then your experiment's gonna suck. Random assignment, after you randomly select, then you randomly assign them to either be in the experimental group or the control group. You can't just say, you know, you just can't say everybody on the left, you get the banana. Everyone on the right, you get a glass of water. You can't do that. You have to randomly assign them. And you have to operationalize the variables. You have to have clear definitions. You have to identify the independent variable and the dependent variable. Dependent variable is what are you measuring? You have to look out for third variable problems. That's extraneous variables. Third variable problems that are going to mess up your experiment. You have to decide this. Are you going to have a blind experiment or a double blind experiment? I, I have that on the next slide, I think. A blind experiment is where the subject does not know if they are receiving the independent variable or not. A double blind is where the researcher doesn't know if they're receiving the independent variable or not. So even the researcher doesn't know. You have to gather your data, and you have to put it on a chart, analyze the results with statistics. And then you have to have replication. Listen to me. This is important. 
after you do your experiment or your study, somebody else, somewhere else, has to replicate that to see if they get the same results. So if you do a study in Kansas City, then somebody in Germany needs to replicate that to see if they get the same results. If your study cannot be replicated, then your study is garbage and it gets no respect. It's garbage. Then you're just a quack. Okay? So write this down. Single blind is when the researcher knows who's getting the independent variable and who's getting the placebo. A double blind is the researcher doesn't know either. Think of Gray's Anatomy where some people are getting the cancer treatment, the mysterious cancer treatment, and some people are just getting a saline bag. And the researcher doesn't know who's getting it and who's not. The researcher has to not know. That is an ethical violation. It's also just a procedural violation as well. All right, moving right along. All right, I'm going to show you a video, and I think this is really good. It's about four and a half minutes long. Nick. But if you're worried about your waistline, it isn't just alcohol's calories that you should be wary of. Could alcohol actually make us eat more? We've returned to the pub lab to do a special demonstration with experimental psychologist Dr. Sam Caton from the University of Sheffield. Her research suggests that alcohol might be able to trick us into eating more without us even noticing. Happy kids and taking part, drinking beer in the name of science, are two sports teams from Queen Mary University of London. We're going to do an experiment today, so it may involve drinking some beer. I think you might be okay with that. Yeah, yeah when's the last? <laughs> Excellent. Okay, let's have the hockey players here and the footballers through at the back in the snug. Normal. We've told them that the purpose of the experiment is to test how alcohol affects their memory. You've got the next five minutes to remember as many as you can. We haven't mentioned anything about food. Time's up. Quite a lot. Though, quite a lot. And the other yeah, thing the students know. don't know... Here come the pints, guys. ...is that whilst one table is being served with normal alcoholic beer... Cheers. 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 ...the other will be given non-alcoholic beer. We're hoping they won't notice the difference. So here are your beers. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Cheers, guys. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a stay of a human. The calories in alcohol are often referred to as empty calories because unlike most food, they don't fill us up. In fact, according to Sam's research, alcohol has the opposite effect. It actually makes us eat more. We're ready. Let's yeah. see how much they eat. So let's see if this is the case with our students. <laughs> Both teams have been served with two pints of beer and then offered bowls of snacks. The question is, will the students that have drunk the alcoholic beer eat more than those that have had the non-alcoholic beer? <laughs> After 15 minutes, we clear away the leftovers. Hiya oh yeah, Sam, these are the peanuts from the footballers. Thank you. And Sam tots up what's been eaten. It's time to fess up to our students. You guys actually had non-alcoholic beer. Could you tell? <laughs> so it tasted different? Not happy about that. Not happy about that. I'm sorry, you got the dead end of the deal here. Oh well, okay. And you guys actually had proper beer. But actually the real part of the experiment was about food intake. And consistent with the results that we obtained in the laboratory, the guys that um, consumed alcohol consumed much more food compared to you guys. So on average, collectively, you consumed 11% more calories compared to the no alcohol group. So you guys were given the same amount of crisps and peanuts for the same amount of time. And the red balls are the people who had alcohol. 
and the green balls are the ones that didn't. <laughs> Overall, if we add together the energy from the alcoholic beverages, you guys consumed 872 calories, whilst you guys consumed 576, and that represents a 34% increase in total energy intake. Each. <laughs> So it seems that alcohol does actually make us eat more. The students who drank the two pints of real beer each consumed on average a total of 300 extra calories. The same as four and a half bourbon biscuits. And all of this without them noticing a thing. The precise mechanism about how alcohol affects appetite is still being researched by scientists. At the end of the day, it's important for you to know, not only does alcohol have a lot of calories, it also has the power to make you eat more. But is the relationship... Okay, so there's a lot to take in there, a lot that I want you to learn from that. And if you're on Edpuzzle, I'll ask you that way. But if you're not on Edpuzzle, I want you to think about these questions. So um, this was an experiment. How do we know? Because there was a control group and an experimental group. That, that means it was an experiment. So we are trying to find out, uh, um, does alcohol cause you to eat more calories? So what is the independent variable? The independent variable is what the experimental group received that the control group didn't. Uh, beer, alcohol, I'm sorry, alcohol is the independent variable. What is the dependent variable? In other words, what are you measuring? How, and let me, let me, Phrase it differently too. How do you operationalize the dependent variable? The dependent variable is how many calories were consumed. What is the control? So who was the end? Who was the experimental group? The guys that received the alcoholic beer. Who was the control group? the guys that received the non-alcoholic beer. Okay. Um, now, here's a harder one, but you need to learn from this. Was this a good experiment? In other words, can you take this experiment and generalize it to everyone in the world? What are the flaws in this experiment? This one might be a challenge for you, but I want to, did, how were they assigned to the groups? Uh, like who got the alcoholic beer and who got the non-alcoholic beer? How did they decide? They did not randomly assign the, the young men to either the experimental group or the control group. What they said was, Okay, you footballers, soccer players, you football players, you, you're in one group, and you hockey players, you are in the other group. They did not do random assignment. Another problem is that they only used young men in England. They did not do random selection. There should have been some Chinese women. There should have been some rich guys, poor guys, rich women, middle class. Uh, you know, everybody. You know, they sh everybody should have. They should have had a a more diverse sample. There should have been random selection, and then those people who are randomly selected should have been randomly assigned to the groups. So there are some flaws. Now, why do you do random assignment? Because this is why. There's a third variable problem. What if playing soccer um, affected their appetite more than playing hockey? I don't know. But if they would have done random assignment, then it would have been better. Um, what if one group had a snack before they got there? That would have been a third variable problem too. So that's why you need random assignment.
and random selection. Okay? Experimenter bias means that the person running the experiment uh, might be biased in one way. If the person running the experiment is going to get paid for the, having results a certain way, then that is a problem. So, for example, um, the science, like say back in the 50s, if the scientists can't said that cigarettes don't cause asthma, and you find out that the scientists were paid by the tobacco companies, then you have a problem. Okay? If you are a medicinal company wanting to sell your medicine, you want your medicine to work. That's experimenter bias. So you got to be careful. Okay? All right, let's do some multiple choice and wrap this up. An experiment is performed to see if background music improves learning. I'm going to let you read that. The independent variable is what? Remember, the independent variable is what one group gets that the other one doesn't. The answer is presence of music. In an experiment to test the effects of hunger on aggressive behavior, aggressive behavior would be what? So does hunger cause aggressive behavior? Does the independent variable cause the dependent variable? The answer is the dependent variable is what are you measuring? Hunger would be the independent variable. Operational definitions are used for which of the following reasons? So in order for there to be replication, you have to specifically, you gotta operationalize your definition. Otherwise, you, how is somebody gonna replicate what you did if you didn't operationalize your definition? If you're gonna do research on bipolar disorder, you gotta define what is bipolar disorder. Okay, so the answer is A. If you don't operationalize your definitions, how's somebody else somewhere else, like in Australia, going to replicate it? Which of the following is used to reduce the effects of confounding variables in experiments? Confounding variables, like... The answer is random assignment. So in the video we just watched, what if they, um, what if playing hockey gives you, makes you more hungry than playing soccer? You know, that it's hard. You have to separate all that, like that third variable problem or nature versus nurture. All right. You read this yourself. The answer is... Extreme. So if you give one group more time to study than the other group, then that is a third variable problem. That is a third variable problem. I need to change that to third variable. All right, do this on your own. So does the independent variable cause the dependent variable? Okay, so IQ scores would be what are you measuring? All right, read this. Neither the research team nor the children knew which drinks had caffeine and which ones did not. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer is, that's a double blind. That's a double blind. All right, that's enough for this video. Thank you very much.